Hey fun fans, Tyler here. For this awesome FRC deep dive, we're going to have an exclusive YouTube giveaway for a 254 t-shirt during the rest of August. All you have to do is be a YouTube subscriber and leave a comment on the video of your favorite 254 robot. You can enter once for each of the 254 deep dive videos, so make sure you comment below. I'm going to jump back in. Uh, Andrew, I do want to ask you uh, one other thing in regards to uh, making your uh, team function really well in Opera. I know there was one other thing you wanted to bring up on here. Yeah, I'd say that um, on the side of how our team has been able to sustain excellence mm -hmm. for so long, one of those is that we, we as a team, we acknowledge that we are extremely privileged, both in our, uh, the, you know, the school that we're at and the location in Silicon Valley and the access to the mentors and the sponsors that we have. Um, and I think that one of the ways that we maintain success with that privilege is by recognizing that and always trying our hardest to, like I think Sumi mentioned a great line there. He said, we want to both raise the floor and the ceiling. So when that comes to, um, you know, the various releases we've done uh, in the past, like, you know, with Cheesy Vision um, back in 2014 or Cheesy Arena, mm -hmm. things like that, we, we, we try to, to bring up the floor with us and I think one other point is the the way that more on a technical side, how our team we believe puts us in you know the top echelon and sometimes is able to make that last little jump from being like a consistent um, division finalist to the recent years when we've been you know going to Einstein winning championships. Yeah. I'd say that though the main driver there is our ability to adapt. We are extremely proficient at making. Um, new parts on the router and the CNC, getting things quickly manufactured. And then we also have um, a high adaptability when it comes to things like pneumatic cylinders, adding um, little toggle switches, kickstands, um, extra actuators is something that we always plan on. We put in, you know, an eight port solenoid manifold. So we always have the ability to add in little um, doodads uh, throughout the competition season. And I think that it's those things that allow you to do to do things like the four cube autonomous mode in 2018 that was only ready by the championship, th things like that. Well, I appreciate that insight on there uh, and lots more to come. Guys, we have so many questions uh, from our audience. We will get to as many as we can uh, through here, but we do have a giveaway. We want to start, of course, chat's been clamoring for it. Uh, so with that said, we have a 2019 254 shirt uh, to give away. Uh, for this so super sweet uh, on here by the way if you win uh, please make sure you message first updates now either on our discord or in twitch and we are shipping you something first name last name mailing address city state and also your t-shirt size as well too um can't believe we gotta say this every single stream but please do that uh and guys what's our first giveaway keyword first giveaway keyword is capra sun <laughs> so capri sun uh c-a-p-r-i space s-u-n is the first keyword uh Connor, if you don't mind in chat, uh, just type that in there just so we have that going for chat and just post that every once in a while once the ridiculous amount of uh, spam comes through. It is two words, by the way, uh, so make sure you do that. That's your opportunity to win. Capri Sun, uh, wow, guys, chat's just going nuts right now for it, so uh, we'll go through that. Uh, so we're going to jump in some of our questions that were submitted by the audience ahead of time. Like I said, we are not going to get to everybody's. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can, and uh, 254, uh, we'll try to be as succinct so we can get through as many as we can as well. So... Uh, first question uh, coming through uh, from uh, Joe's Bell, Joe's Bow Belly uh, from Team Six Eight Three Two wants to know what your lifts are made out of for your twenty nineteen robot. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that. So um, this year, our twenty nineteen robot was just a single stage elevator. Um, it's composed of an outer uh, fixed uprights. Those are the blue powder coated tubes, and then the inner carriage is a assembly of uh, the black powder coated tubes and billet end caps. So on the outside, it's a two inch by one inch by 16th inch wall uh, square or uh, square corner rectangular tubing. And that uh, was plenty strong. We have a crossbar at the top that is a billet piece of half inch thick um, aluminum. And then at the bottom, the uprights are affixed down into the turret plate on little feet. And then the carriage itself is made of two inch by one inch by 16th inch tubes. There's billet end caps that go in the top to hold the shoulder pivot. Um, and then the bearings of the carriage that ride on the fixed uprights come off of little uh, billet blocks. You can see um, a lot of screenshots in a Chief Delphi thread where I answered a bunch of questions about the robot. You get some more close up shots 
compared to what you'd find in the technical binder. Um, we can find, I'll put a link to that uh, yeah. thread in the chat. All right, next question uh, coming in uh, is the Swerve question I think a lot of people have been asking on there. So uh, Nick862 and a lot of other people have been asking, uh, and uh, specifically what he wrote is, due to Swerve becoming more common in FRC, his words, not mine, uh, have you guys ever considered switching to Swerve? So we showed that robot before. Uh, is that something you guys are looking at doing in the competition season? I'll take that. Um, yes uh, and no at the same time, I guess. Sure. Um We'd like to have that option, so we have been working on it for the past two years in the off season. So, like for this year's game, there are like obvious good parts to having a swerve. So, um, we'd like to have that option, especially for games like this. Um, but there is still place for a West Coast drive, like games like 2014, even game 2017 for sure too. Even games like 2018 could be executed just as well the west coast drive so we're not, we're not planning on switching we're just like to have that option as well yeah that's a that's a really good point is that even if you're not planning on actively doing it you have that in your pocket in case you need because who knows what the game's going to be right um i mean you guys probably know come on so just kidding uh, yeah no <laughs> <laughs> all right uh new question uh coming up here uh from uh, actually from connor mcbride uh, in chat, uh, wants to know. Uh, it's a follow up to the Swerve module. Are there any? Is there any documentation on the Austrians and Swerve module that anybody can find anywhere? Or do you plan on releasing it? Um, we have not published anything. I feel like I could totally write up some stuff. Right now, we're working on a new Swerve that we'll be bringing, hopefully, if we finish, to Mantown Throwdown, and that would have a different architecture. So I'm not sure how much learnings I really want to share about the first architecture. Sure. And I also don't think that we should claim to be experts in Swerve. Our first Swerve was uh, not very good. Uh, it didn't even, the whole robot didn't even make it into the eliminations at the off season. So <laughs> I think there's some benefits in the way that, you know, we're kind of pulling in elements from 1323's uh, modules, but then also elements from 2910's, um, the way they do the wheel bevel lower section of the module. It's not the lightest Swerve module. It's not the most compact. Um, and I think that it has potential, but I also think that if teams you know, really want to do another Swerve, there's, there's plenty on Chief Delphi to uh, be inspired from also. Uh, so next question, some of these might require a little bit of explanation on your guys' end because it, it does get a little specific. Uh, we had uh, Billy Doherty from 4096 ask, uh, what tipped you off to the issues you had with Colson wheels on carpet and can you explain the process you use to verify, verify the cause and validate a solution? Uh, I can talk a little bit about that. So um, last year, our 2018 robot, um, we started the uh, we started our first competition and we had it all Colson's. And then afterwards, uh, or, or we at least our middle wheels were Colson's. And then we switched um, to uh, the blue nitrile uh, treaded wheels uh, mid-season. And one thing that we noticed, especially with autonomous, was that it was we were having problems with like consistency, and uh, we weren't really sure why. And um, we were noticing that our Colsons were wearing down a lot. So um, we actually, what we did was uh, for our odometry calculation, we multiplied our uh, wheel diameter by 0.99, and that seemed to fix all of our problems. So we decided instead of uh, just dealing with the issues of um, wearing down, we should try a different solution, and this is what we came up with. Yeah, I can add to that a little bit. Um, also, back at the lab when we were uh, testing odometry for um, Colson's, we noticed that we were getting different values based on the direction of the carpet weave. So that may or may not be like our worn down field carpet, but um, having the blue nitrile wheels um, gave us more consistent results based on the weave and direction of the carpet. Uh, next question coming up here is kind of a two-parter and uh, a, a very interesting one that, that I always like to ask teams, especially high-end teams as well, too, is looking at uh, a, a team that I think has a lot of expectations all the time, right? You know, something – I'm going to be really frank. Something this year that we heard from a lot of people is like, oh, 254 isn't good anymore. The robot's not nearly where it was this year. Blah, 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 BS, blah, right? And, it, I mean, and you guys showed, obviously, you guys are still – every single year incredible. And even if you didn't have the best year, that doesn't mean you're a bad team, Right. And so something I got to ask that, uh, that both Stell and Necro Creature kind of asked together, uh, 
what kind of issues do you face with being so mainstream as a team? Uh, do you have any added pressure? And then how do you keep the students from kind of being level-headed? Uh, as you guys, the students, can probably answer this quite well uh, in regards to when you have success year after year. How do you stay humble, and how do you uh, kind of uh, hold up to the pressure that comes with it every year? Yeah, so um, I, I can answer the one about how we keep students humble, yeah. especially um, this year, like, we – we were like a little like we weren't as confident in going into like many of our tournaments, but even in previous years where we were maybe a little bit more com uh, confident, we just kind of created um, on, on our team a culture and definitely the mentors help with this with uh, like sustaining the culture that like um, whatever we do, we can always do better. So uh, it's part of, it ha goes hand in hand with that iterative design process that like no matter what, we can always design something better. We can always program something better. So we're always reaching for a goal that we may not, we uh, are never able to attain so that um, our students always have something to strive for. And we always know that we uh, can always do better and perform better. And uh, we're always able to like uh, keep that as a goal rather than seeing ourselves as like, having already attained the best that we can and stuff like that. So moving on in regards to, uh, and we're going to kind of be switching a lot of gears here because a lot of different questions coming in. Uh, uh, Kristen from uh, 2655 uh, asked, uh, what is, in your opinion, uh, the best high dollar investment for a builder fabrication shop uh, for low cost? Have you guys found any success in regards to uh, your shop, or if you have a team maybe that comes in that's a low resource team, what would you recommend to them uh, for if they had a you know a small amount to invest? What would be one of the biggest impacts for them? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that probably none of us three are super experts on that. I recommend that you reach out to Corey McBride, one of our lead um, mentors, who's kind of manages the shop and manufacturing. Uh, if I had to take a guess, I, I mean, it really there's different tiers, right? Like. If you're just working out of a classroom with with power tools and and you, maybe maybe you even have a power saw, um, that's a good first step. But mm -hmm. once you really get something like a drill press or a manual mill, you can get precision parts, which is really important for making things like intakes. Um, having the ability to have CNC capability, I think, is oftentimes. Uh, overvalued like you can get pretty far with just a manual mill and some patience but when if I, among the cnc machines which i think this question is referring to i would say that our favorite right now is probably a, a small um cnc router sure. for two-dimensional plates you can make 2d plates you can do box tubing um and and that really opens up the door some of the other tools that we have in our shop include um a C, um, cnc mill so a three-axis hoss that allows us to do billet parts, but that's far from necessary for most teams. And then we also have a pretty powerful laser cutter that allows us to um, make prototypes, but also make field elements. So we, we have a field that we share with local California teams. And so we have to make all the elements for the rocket and, and you know those panels and such. But I think that of, of among those three big pieces of CNC equipment, the router is really the, the most versatile. Uh, maybe a little bit more uh, kind of just jovial question for everybody here. If we can just go around starting with Sumi. Uh, uh, who asked this on here? Uh, on Chief Delphi, Wawa24 said, uh, what is your uh, favorite and least favorite game that you've either participated in or just in general? What what games you really like and what was your least favorite to participate in, Sumi? Um, so just from like a spectator perspective, I guess, um, I – I really like Power Up because um, you were able to see the um, how teams were stacking up each other, and it's more clear just from watching the game like who's winning and who's not. Um, and I like the uh, action of the teeter totters. Uh, I did not like this game from that perspective since it was um, uh, extremely game. hard. Yeah, uh, since it was extremely hard to like watch both alliances at once and kind of see who's doing better. And also, like half of the field wasn't even facing you, so it was a little hard to watch that. Daniel? Okay. Uh, for me, I would say out of all the games that I've been a part of, I would say 2017 was my favorite. Um, I liked 2017 and 2018 because they were like easy to watch from a spectator perspective. Like you could see that easy, like it's ex more exciting to watch a robot shoot balls into um, a hoop than it is to see them place discs on um, – a rocket, in my opinion. Also, 
Uh, what I liked about 2017 more than 2018 was that the level of like play was more even in 2017. Because I feel like in 2018, if you got that advantage in the Auton and you have that advantage from the first part uh, of the game, the match is kind of already won. Like it's very difficult for um, smaller teams and um, to play on a 28 to play 2018. I've heard great things about stronghold as well, but I can't really speak to that. Sure. Andrew, how about yourself? Andrew, how long have you been in first four? Yeah. So my rookie year was uh, the 2012 season and I graduated in 2015. Sure. Um, my favorite game has got to be 2014. That was, you know, my first time being there at the world championships for a win. Um, I was really involved as a junior that year. And just the way that it required all three robots in coordination and there was only one large ball to track uh, made it so that you could super easily follow um, what was happening. And I mean, just the excitement and Einstein finals match three, the last seven seconds, all five robots piled in the back corner. We sneak through last buzzer beater shot. Um, I don't think any other game is going to top that. It's kind of cool to see that everybody has their own kind of favorite of things, right? Um, and as we go through, that's that's always the kind of the fascinating thing is like everybody kind of has throughout the years their own, their own you know, I like this one because of this, that sort of thing. So that's great. Uh, next question here, uh, looking at uh, driver practice, let's talk about that a little bit. How do you, uh, Dari uh, and a couple others have asked, uh, what methods do you use for driver practice? Uh, do you do any drills? How do you even select your drivers in the first place? Yeah, uh, I can take this question. So uh, driver selection is we have a process. Um, the first first part is a rules test. And the rules test isn't the most important. But basically, what we're trying to gauge is like how involved the member is. So like, um, we go over like the rules through the first couple of weeks. So like, if they're really involved, uh, they should know the basic rules. Whereas like, if they're just showing up for like driver trials, they will have no idea. Hmm. And then after that, we just kind of uh, have them uh, drive the previous year's robot and uh, see how they are at handling. But um, the most important things that look at we look at at driver selection is like how dedicated they are throughout the build and throughout like uh, driver trials, which making it to all the uh, different meetings and stuff like that. And also um, how mature they are, because we really want our to be able to rely on our drive team throughout competition. And then uh, when it comes to driver practice. Um, uh, we do a bunch of drills. Uh, mainly we have our, our two drive coach, drive and strategy coaches, uh, Kevin and Tom. Uh, they're really um, experienced with driving and uh, over the years. So um, they drive uh, defense bots against us and we do kind of uh, situational drills like that where um, we have uh, them playing against uh, defenders. And um, we have, a, a, well, on our field, um, we have a nest cam. So even uh, like right after school, when our mentors aren't able to make it to work, uh, we're there. We have our drivers running cycles, and um, uh, one of our mentors, if they have some off time at work, they can watch and give them pointers and stuff like that. Uh, we had uh, Phil McJoe and Chief Delphi and a couple others as well asking about uh, Neos. Uh, did you guys use them on your robot this year? What was your experience, and do you plan on using them for future seasons? Yeah, so uh, I can also take this one. So we use it on our drive base this year, uh, kind of out of necessity because um, we uh, there was some issue. I, I'm sure Torrance or Daniel could elaborate on why the turret couldn't fit with the mini sims. Um, but uh, yeah, we ended up using a two two neo on each uh, drive uh, each drive gearbox um, on our drive base. And um, so as for our experience with them, uh, personally from a software expect, uh, perspective. Um, I didn't like them too much. We had some issues like, um, I believe it's like Qualls 57 or something at uh, SVR where uh, they didn't initialize correctly and like one side of our drive base just died mm -hmm. on startup so we couldn't drive that match. And so we had issues like that that it took a lot of debugging to figure out. And also the other issue that we had ran into was um, because of um, the um, non-linearity in the um, brushless motor, we couldn't necessarily use our same auto stack from uh, 2018, which is far more um, accurate and reliable than any of our uh, other autonomous codes. Even though um, this year's was like reasonably reliable, that still would have been like even better. 
So uh, we had to revert to previous ones just for out of necessity. Um, as for like future, um, definitely like the Neo itself was very good. All of my uh, issues are with like the Spark Max and software. Sure. But um, like, uh, I guess we'll just have to see um, based on any other products or um, if the Neo software gets better and stuff like that. Yeah, that's interesting to see is you always got to keep your options open. There might be new things coming out, too, to try. Who knows, right, um, as we go through. So uh, speaking about this year, so you're talking about some challenges you had uh, with, with your drive. What about other challenges? What would you say was your biggest challenge this year, uh, either as a team or as a robot or, or just in general for 2019? Well, I can speak to that. I feel like the decision to go with the turret was, like, a huge challenge. Um, I guess the – most obvious problem that we had was how to wire half of the robot when it's spinning around on a turret. So we ended up come, we came up with a design that was for the cable man, or we came up with a cable management solution that worked, but um, definitely required a lot of servicing and maintenance. And it also took up, three inches of space above our drivetrain that we couldn't use for anything else just to make room for that cable chain so we couldn't have anything sticking up, up over the drive base. So kind of, kind of a follow-up on that, uh, Aaron Lee asked in Chief Delphi, so how do you plan your wires and tubes so well? Like on your, you, you guys look at your arm and stuff, and everything looks very clean, obviously, and there's some really cool stuff. I remember when we did the behind the bumpers with you guys, you described some really cool things that are a part of it. Can you, do you mind going a little bit more in detail on that? Yeah, um, I guess – one of the main philosophies is like um, function follows form, I guess. Um, oftentimes when you like route, we try to route our cables through tubing as much as possible. For example, our elevator and um, our turret, we have it, we have all our wires attached to something else. So it's, we never have free hanging wires anywhere or tubing anywhere. It's always uh, zip tied to the drive base or to the base plate or uh, inside a tube or um, inside an IGUS chain. Um, another thing that I think, a little thing that makes our robot look a little cleaner is um, we have like a tunnel for our IGUS. We didn't have that um, specifically this year. We have it in years past. So just to make sure that I guess chain or the energy chain is not flopping around everywhere. It we just make sure that it has a place and a clear space to go through. A uh, f- couple questions in regards to asking on the size wheels that you do. I know uh, I, I saw Jesse King chief Duff. I asked, uh, I think kind of jokingly, how do you, how do you not get stuck on your four inch wheels? Uh, but what made you decide on four inch versus uh, six inch wheels or kind of what was that decision making process in general? I yeah, think that's a, a pretty um, contentious point on our team. You know, in 2018, we got away with four inch wheels by dropping them as low as we could relative to the tube. Basically also using 16th inch wall tube allows you to drop the bearing even a little bit lower. Um, And, you know, the wheels are slightly more than four inches when you have the, the full OD of the tread there. And then also we make sure that the belly pan is extremely flush. So that means blind um, tapping screws down into the belly pan or doing countersunk holes up. So even zip ties, we use the smallest, uh, thinnest zip ties if they're gonna um, come down underneath the belly pan. And then when it comes to uh, just the testing of that, we will very early on build a chassis out of VersaFrame um, with the proposed wheel center center distance and um, frame dimensions and drive that up and down everything. Unlike some teams, like I think, um, you know, uh, JVN wrote in his blog for Team 148 mm-hmm. that like in 2018, they used large wheels because they wanted to never get stuck crossing the, the compound corner on the platform. That was not a strategic priority that we believed we needed. We found an alternative way to drive a robot up onto that platform that kind of had it going up at um, about 45 degrees on the straight side. You see in all our videos of us climbing and parallel parking up there. So it's kind of a strategic decision. If you train your drivers to, to not drive up um, incorrectly and get stuck, then they can't get stuck. Makes a lot of sense. 
Uh, so we're only going to ask a couple more. We're going to do our first giveaway in just a moment uh, as well, too, as, of course, we're running a little bit uh, long on time on here. Uh, something uh, that a few people asked in regards to uh, – we talked about kind of how your students are, are broken up, right, and uh, how your students are involved on the team. Uh, how do you when – you, when you bring, like, a, a, a freshman or sophomore, are they primarily on the VEX team or do they – uh, are they on the FRC team? Kind of what level does that break up at? And then how do you like engage like younger students right away in the program? Yeah, I, um, uh, I can take this one. So what we're doing this year is actually different from what we've had in previous years. So we're having um, all members, including uh, freshmen, uh, join into directly VEX or FRC. And um, the reason for this is that uh, we want them to have enough time dedicated to that program to skill, like build the necessary skills so that during the actual competition season in VEX and FRC, they're prepared. Uh, whereas what we've seen in the past is that if we've let that, uh, if we have students uh, like kind of be like more flexible with what uh, program they can do, then they do a lot of VEX in, uh, fresh, in the first semester, which is great, sure. but then they come completely unprepared to the FRC season. And then, um, they don't necessarily have a lot to do at build because uh, they don't have the necessary skills. So uh, we're trying to like um, diminish that problem by making sure that they're each in one program. And uh, that way um, they can uh, stay committed to that program and we uh, have them get trained for whatever they're specifically doing for that year. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent.